think is a bet too far, but the Galio, it's a possibility. Well, we'll find out soon because here it is time for game five between WE and Cloud9. The winner will move on to the quarterfinals to face Samsung Galaxy. But right now, you just have to think about the draft. In WE, there's Callista and there's Tristana. I love how the crowd is now cheering Tristana first, fans. That's where we've gotten to in the world's meta. And the Callista yep, is going to be banned away. So far, pretty standard from WE. They have not allowed Cloud9 to pick Ezreal on red side once today. This is the pivotal band that decides the rest of the dominoes because if C9 doesn't ban either support, Team WE has the option for a first pick John Alulu. And there it is. All right, well, that's pretty much, hey, we're not banning either. What do you guys want to do? They actually take Rumble away from 957 very early into this. This might mean that Impact would be okay with the Maokai pick. Also a Jarvan ban, this dictates that they don't want to trade things back around if they do have that one power pick because they were expecting the Jarvan to be picked in the one, two slot by C9. Sejuani first pick, a real possibility if it's left open, even though it hasn't found as much success today as in previous days. A lot available here for WE. Has to be Galio though, right for Cloud9. There's a lot of discussion by the team, but they actually banned Zaya. So now the question is, do you first pick Galio with Janna Sej being the next two things you give up? Or is this that situation we talked about where Team WE dares Jensen to play it? So my read on this is that you can't take Galio first pick because Janna Kate can just be taken on red side as a mm -hmm. duo. So now they're basically daring Cloud9 to take away the Caitlyn. They can just go Cogmore on blue side, for example, and be pretty happy. Cloud9 do want, not want to give up Janna Kate, and I think it was smart. But WE to first pick away the John. Yeah, even though Caitlyn is winless in this series, Sneaky did do over 1,700 damage per minute with this pick. But it means Galio is up on the next rotation for Team WE. Well, that should be the pretty simple pick here. WE hover it. The crowd cheers. It's Galio Cobmo. I mean, it just has to be, right? Because how do you crash the bottom lane turret against a Galio team? Every time you push up or think about diving, the Galio can stuff that play. Watch this, there's the Kog'Maw. We got the order slightly wrong, but WE should be taking these champions, and they do. Cloud9 are playing with fire here. WE going about as WE as can be. The first visit of Galio on the day. Now, Malzahar is the pick that we saw into it in the victory yesterday. They'd probably have to take it here. It's another one of those picks that Jensen hasn't really specialized in, but it's become almost the meta pick into the Galio. There's still there's others, like Lucian, for example. We've seen Ryze attempted and failed. Seeing what they decide on, they're just going to go for the more standard Lulu. Second round bans for Team WE are going to be very intriguing. Yeah, we also don't know exactly where the Galio is going. The assumption is mid because sure. you need to be able to stop it, but you have to keep in mind that it could just go top lane, so Jensen has to be a little bit careful about what he decides to blind pick. Now, Cho'Gath at this pick for Sneaky is the god tier, because Cho'Gath actually does really well against top lane Galio, whose damage, uh, damage mitigation is going to be affecting the true damage. So that's why we saw uh, Samsung Galaxy drafting at one point the Malzar and Cho'Gath to stop a flex pick coming through of the Galley. And Papa Smithy, I think the Singe ban is actually required here because even though Team WE can stuff the engages in the bottom lane, how are they going to force fights? They've done it before with Galio Rumble and just kind of willed their way to a victory with the Grogus jungle. I wouldn't mind seeing a Grogus ban from C9 to try and take away as much engage as possible from this Team WE lineup. We'll see what they decide on. Cloud9's final ban of this series will be Jace. Taking the option away from G8. Again, in the back of their minds, they know 957 can play the Galio as well. Initiation for Cloud9 will be what you think you want. But the moment you see Galio Jana initiating on it, it's nigh on impossible. So something to shred the front line like the Malzahar. Maybe the only way to get access to the Gogma, deleting the front line before you can even get access to the back line. So, just with Jana Galio, your options for a viable team comp are pretty narrow for Cloud9. Exactly, and it's almost just saying, hey, play Kite Back. Kite Back as much as you want and assume you can take it better to late game, and that's where they're kind of pushing Team WE here. Because if Team WE puts the Galio mid, they're going to have a low damage profile in the late game, almost only damage on Kogma, and potentially C9 can now scale that way. But if they move the Galio top lane, then they aren't unable to stop the turret dives early in the bottom lane because the Galio can't roam down. Regardless of what else, ooh. Gotta I was about Goddess. to say, I love the Rek'Sai, but again, 
being pushed to that point you mentioned, Gragas. Maca also open, so if WWE don't want to flex. The NAR is super interesting right here because it would give them late game push priority on the Shen. On a simple point, early game, they also have pushing lanes, and Cloud9 with the Caitlyn drop want to go around and take turrets, starting with unlocking themselves from the bot side. So I can understand it. It'd be a pushing lane in top side on the Shen. The Galio basically auto wins every push war. But it's all down to this last pick for Cloud9. Just watch these two. There's always so much conversation between Reaper and Jensen, but Jensen says, I have some picks. I could probably play Mouse, but today I will finish my tournament or continue by playing Ariana. It's interesting they took the Ariana. To me, this is a very risky pick in this particular draft because it says to me, we need Sneaky to actually set the pace. Sneaky needs to get out of lane and be able to take down turrets, keep the gold lead pretty large for Cloud9. Actually being able to shockwave and do damage to the, through this front line, or at least kill the front line if you can't get to the Cogmore, is so difficult to achieve. It's a really interesting decision. Yeah, and in 137 competitive games on record this year, 957 has played NAR once and lost. So as far as being pushed to the brink of your champion pools, we are seeing it in this game. They're trying to take the NAR because of the matchup, but it is not something Team WE has played with often. And again, this is, this is what happens when you push a game, a series, sorry, to this final game, is that something somewhere has to change. You know, you are pushed to your limit truly when you go the distance in a best of five. And I, at some point, 957 was like, all right, I need to change up something. I want to play NAR. That feels like the best pick for me in the matchup and for the team. Sorry if you haven't played it that much, because you got to prove it now. He's going to have a target on his head, Sejuani Shen with one taunt can basically stack up the passive and potentially try to snowball early through the NAR lane, who is very squishy in the early levels. So Condi's jungle pathing, whether for once he'll actually pay a bit of his attention to the man who's been on island the entire tournament for WE, the NAR from 957. So many questions, and finally, we're going to get an answer on this series. And 957 has such a good pick for the comp, it's just a matter of whether or not they can make it work. Because if they do not have that NAR in the top lane, and instead they go with something like a Maokai. They are all magic damage, and it falls off tremendously in the late game for all the shields that C9 has. But he can be that physical damage threat that forces you to dump gold into armor for the split push and makes impact killable in the team fights. But he has to do well on it for that to work. Well, GA again, flashing the flare, feeling confident in the crowd. Understandably goes wild. Game five between WE and C9. The odds of this happening, I think, before were very low as Jensen returns with Flair in kind. Both these teams needing to step up to the pressure of Game 5. One game at this point to decide who faces Samsung in the semifinals of Worlds. Last game, Contracts had his worst jungle start that we've seen. The level 2 gank not necessarily working, falling behind Condi's pace. It's got to start well this way. Yeah, decision making to invade some of those camps at the Gromp at level five really exacerbated the early game problems for C9. They fell down, were not able to get up. Interesting to note that neither team goes for any sort of aggressive vision. It's a defensive five man start for both sides. I think predictability for Condi is a big thing for C9 to get eyes on, given that it's going to be pushing lanes almost exclusively for WE. Yeah, and also got to point out that Team WE has insane disengage in the team fight phase. Janna and Gragas can both knock back. It's so hard to get through a Galio. Even Nar can technically knock you back with Mega Nar if he wants to. C9, if they do engage, has to be so clean and crisp with that. But both teams are going to struggle to actually force fights in this match. Mystic forcing something here, level one, shield on. Get some W damage down. Need to do it. Want to get back, does auto onto Ben. Now Mystic can eat some trades, but Sneaky not quite getting enough damage with the auto done with Ben able to shield. Again, a, a lot of onus on this lane. To a right for C9, and I think for WB to continue to play the balance that they have played all series long. Mystic, he loves to be aggressive and get ahead if he can, but he'll need to have a lot of discipline to really go through what has been a grueling series. Yeah, and we watched this lane play out in game one. If Sneaky and Smoothie can get it working the exact same way, you would expect that turret to fall around eight or 10 minutes. But we also know that one mistake with the Caitlyn lane, as we saw from Mystic and Ben when they got double killed by Sneaky, just ends the game. Because if the Caitlyn falls behind the item curve, there's really no coming back. Yeah, that's the predictor for me. If C9 pick up the first turret, and especially if it's bot side, 
That is what they need to start their game plan rolling. If somehow, anywhere on the map, WE pick up first turret, and suddenly, Caitlyn is responding to pressure being enacted by WE, I think C9 are done. So that's really about the early game. They committed to it with this Caitlyn and Lulu. That's why you will expect Contracts to spend most of his time jungling on the bot side after this early Ooh, visit. Great interrupt there, uh, Shea. Probably gonna be forced to flash, get stunned, but very tanky on the Galio Thunderlord's proc in from Jensen, but Shea just casually walks away. He doesn't even use flash. The damage reduction that Galio has from that taunt, which then gives him the Courage Shield when you gank him, is one of the reasons he is so immovable from that mid lane. It wasn't a high cost gank for Contracts, and it will push him back for the recall, but he teleports right back in, keeps up the shove. Does mean that Gragas has a pretty good read that he's not going to be bot side right now, this Contracts. They need to go for Smoothie. He was spotted though. Smoothie going to walk away from the slow, and Tundi gives it up. Follow up, not the highest from level three Cogmo and Ajana, so no flashes burned there. That would have been the ideal, especially if it was on Smoothie, but Cloud9 can return to normalcy in the bot lane. But you can see already the Galio roam pressure can add so much to the early game. We've already seen missing pings when he roamed down towards the bottom lane and Contracts was going to come up for the gank. He then shoves in, gets a deep control ward to prevent any roams from top lane as well. If he can get any sort of control wards bottom side, like we've mentioned a couple of times in Talia games, then every time Caitlyn does her job, which is to walk up to the turret and take pot shots basically every minion wave, if she is missing from mid lane, the chance of Gragas and also the hero's entrance gets higher and higher. So mid lane control, specifically bot side, Jensen wants to keep Jia as ac accountable as possible and also to keep him in lane as much as possible. They're doing a good job pressuring Shea, but again, it's a Kalio. Not really a whole lot to worry about. Actually, Justice Punch gonna force Jensen to shield himself. And again, Shea just shoving in every single wave as Condi's back in bot lane. Yeah, Contracts are spotted top lane on awards. They're safe to fully all in Smoothie here. Smoothie's the first one. Still has his flash. Gonna have to make this really count. Damage still there. Late Condi flash from Smoothie, but it, probably enough to save his life. Thought maybe Condi would go for the body slam flash, but it would have been his death as well because there was no minions to help him on the way out. And a very important gank for the tempo of that lane, mainly because of the top lane ward that they had, enabling them to be so aggressive. And Galio makes this such a struggle for contracts, because in a different game, if you don't have this auto-push lane, the unkillable gargoyle in mid lane, you split the map, you play around bot side, you trust that you'll have your mid laner react, but Galio always reacts first, even before level six, because of how much he can push much safer for Sejuani to be topside contracts, doesn't want to give up any kills like in the previous game, but that means that the the collateral damage is that Smoothie has to give up his flash. Incoming die perhaps though, well the way he's not on the spot for it, instead contracts, he's gonna ward out that Grump, Condi actually now here, looks like Condi may lose this, unbeknownst to him. No one has spotted each other yet, now contracts will see him. Thing there, looks like Condi's going top lane, Impact needs to book it. He does, and Condi does smite away the Grump. This also lets Contracts know that he's pretty safe in there, and I also want to pose a question. You expect the Caitlyn to kill the turret in a lot of scenarios, but the late game scaling doesn't need to be the Caitlyn in this game. Maybe C9 is playing this lane to split draw jungle attention because if they can get their, their top lane and mid lane ahead, they potentially win the late game team fights anyway. So it's a very unique draft we've seen here where neither team allowed them to kind of complete the mecha team comp. They both have elements of early game and elements of late game, and it's all mashed together in this fifth game. And I follow your logic, because you think about the late game and the fact that it's a one damage dealer comp, Nara with a bit of an assist, but one and a half would be the generous way to look at it. And we saw yesterday the Galio comp be outpaced for damage, but it's really intriguing, because to me it's all about vision control. If Orianna has full information, can choose her shockwave judiciously at six items, Maybe there's a way that you're able to just power down the front line, kill the Galio. But in a different game, where they fall behind in vision at any point, six items, Galio jumps on, suddenly the shockwave is never going to be in the right spot because of all the gap close, and then that chance goes away. And the Gragas threat also with the ult. So actually pulling off the big shockwave, whatever it needs to be in the late game, is kind of only possible with vision advantage. Yeah, and when we think about WE and their knowledge of playing around Galio, they have an 85% win rate with Galio mid this year. So very comfortable, very confident protecting it. And I think that's why, like, that turret's barely touched by C9, because even pre-6, Galio can assist with that presence in the bot lane just by roaming and getting vision control. Literally locking in Galio probably adds five minutes automatically to the turret destroying time. We've seen as early as seven minutes 
I think any earlier than about 15 is very difficult to engineer. They're not going to blow a flash anytime soon. It's going to be double teleport in a moment. And in addition to the hero's entrance, so very, very difficult for C9 to go for the standard uh, Caitlyn Lulu flag. Even though we are on kind of a very historic moment, but either of these teams, depending on the result of the game, both teams playing very cautiously here. Smoothie gets a couple CSs. We have sold Caitlyn's returning to lane, but Mystic unopposed, really equal in CS versus Sneaky now making his first back. That's a great spot for Kog'Maw to be in. Yeah, and neither team really wants to make a mistake in this game, so I think there's a chance we see a very late first blood. It takes such a commitment to even go for a kill that the chance of a backfire is huge. But while the Drake dies, I want to point your attention to this stat here. We remember all the range jumblers coming through from contracts in the group stage where he was doing 22% of damage. Sneaky's picking up the slack here. They've changed priority. It's back to the tank junglers, and that's why Sneaky's around the tournament average, in fact, around Mystic's numbers, jumping up to 43% on the day. And those were WE's numbers from the group stage, with the jungler not doing very much and the AD carry doing the lion's share of it. So definitely matching their opponents here. Drax catches Condi's dead, not committed. They want to go for a power frost in. In fact, should be able to ride in. Ulti not enough. Oh my god, Condi almost saves his own life, but Jensen, he'll be the one with first blood. They make the commit work, but that top lane is now getting just wailed on by the Gnar. Now it will eventually take the tower, but if they can actually take bot lane tower, maybe it's all worth it. They're going to keep going, Jack. Got to track the Galio. He's moving down towards that lane already. Sneaky's just got to run away. Took too much damage, forced the flash. That turret's going to stay safe. That's so awkward. Losing that trade means that Gnar will get a turret for free over time. You'd have to imagine here. Shen will back, does not have teleport to get back to lane. If they keep his health up, maybe they can try to engineer dive with flashes available on WE, but now it's almost impossible. It is so risky. No defensive heal for Smoothie. Teleport up for Nar. Teleport up for Shie. Shie TP's in. Impact gets out. They know they Mark canceled as well. Yeah, but 957 again. Tino tried to force the trade turrets, but no trade happening just yet. Double cancel was the end result. So a lot happens in an instant there, but WE pick up first brick, first turret in the top side for free, and all of Impact's time was wasted. Yeah, and I think that's also why we weren't expecting huge commits for First Blood, because in going for that play, they gave up that pressure top lane and now lost the top lane turret. Whereas if Team WE would have gone for a similar play with the Galio all thing down, then they potentially could have lost the mid lane turret to Jensen. The very slim margins as far as wave push is concerned in this match. Well, at least for Cloud9, I could be the second best person to get it. Does get First Blood. Jensen, Morella, Nomicon already finished from that first blood kill and watch this one again. I mean, still a good combo. They get the permafrost detonation post flash, still able to chain, and then the shockwave does technically stay in place from where he started the cast when you're dealing with uh, the ball delivery system, so to speak. That's why it's a con. Yeah, the graphic was definitely very misleading, but the damage did resolve, so that was big for C9. But I kind of take your side of the coin where I'm like, okay, they killed him, but they couldn't turn it into a bot lane turret. Gia was still alive. He was going to be within Hero's entrance, not getting the objective from a big investment. Remember, in fact, still about 60 seconds left on the cooldown means that it was really just a kill. They haven't even been able to cement wards in the red side jungle of WE. And I think the correct play would have been for Impact to immediately recall and run back top lane because then the turret probably would have still had another wave left. But the fact that they thought about that bottom lane play when double teleport is up. Yes, they forced the double cancel out, but those are probably going to be back before C9 can get enough pressure to start the next play. And it was just outplayed by Team WE. You notice that Janna will re-enter lane with an Arden sensor advantage. So one more back timing for C9 means that Mystic's going to be even more immovable in the 2v2. Certainly a good thing there. And Smoothie a little bit behind on gold as far as that completion goes. He's racing as fast as he can to get there, but will be a little while there. I think he also made it back for Zerka Greaves and two daggers joining with that BF sword, but Mystic again just looking to farm it up and skip the blasting ones. Yeah, this puts C9's bottom lane in a really difficult spot. Arden Sensor is at its most powerful upon the point of completion, and it actually gets a little bit worse as the game goes on, since it's all about flat numbers. It's life on hit, it's magic damage on hit, and you're seeing the effects of one team having Sensor and the other one. Yep, Mystic is running away. Help force coming from Contract, but he's a little late. Actually found Condi, so Jungler's gonna be called off from the attempt in bot lane.
you think this was some sort of aggressive play from Contracts, but he knows very well that Galio can be there at any moment. So it's very difficult to win the tug of war against Galio. We have the extra information that Gia has completed his recall. So it doesn't happen very often, but they might actually steal an objective under his nose. They get the red buff. There's also the Shen ultimate up by impact. He's playing very far back in that top lane uh, in an attempt to always be free to ult in, but in doing so is giving 957 a fairly large lead. Team at Chen certainly wants to play uh, defensively versus the Black Cleaver completion already for 957. Usually you want to give Mystic the uh, turret goal, but 957 getting it tonight for him as well. And this is just getting untenable in the bot side. Yeah, the laning phase is over when it comes to 2v2 trades until Arden Sensor is complete. Contracts sniffing for an ultimate. Going, going in. Going all in. Here comes Shen. 4v2. Ben, he's going to be the first one to stand. They're going to try and gain the Arden Sensor. Ben, Monsoon, not enough. As now Mystic's the next target. Jensen, he's also here, but she had made it through. Truckman fights up both after Mystic Flash and Cloud9. They get to. They're looking for the third. They'll get it all. Disaster for Team WE in that bottom lane. She teleports down instead of ulting down, then gets caught in the shockwave without being able to ult. Poppy will still lose the turret over time. Able to teleport and misses. There it now. is. They might lose impact afterwards. That's a red buff nar. Better run. Oh, hop under the minion just barely. Spirit's refuge up. Jensen coming for a bit of help, but he's pretty far away. Impact still taking damage. Hyperprox again. And I think maybe Megan I would have saved impact. Jensen there just in case. So it ends up being a turret trade, but the sort of turret that's difficult to return to for WE for time. Andy eventually will lose the turret under his nose, but three kills as well for C9. They were behind in the gold race. They catapult themselves just marginally ahead, but this will mean Arden Center. This will mean item completions. It was desperately needed because already it felt like the game was slowly slipping away from Cloud9. And it's probably still going to be a tempo advantage for Team WE as they push forward in an attempt to delay more recalls. Nearly an indefensible turret. Uh, right now on the bottom side, so probably going to be three turrets to one. But watching this play, they full commit and they go on to Ben right away. It's not a proactive play you love to see with Shen comps, using it purely to, as a conduit to get Shen into the front line. Jensen hits the shockwave, even though Mystic flashes, he's still in the AoE. The AoEs have been on point, Baker-esque, with his ability to get people from what feels like extra range. They take the three kills, but WE just brute force down at first. And they opt for the Infernal instead of the bottom lane turret because they figure they can get that turret whenever they want with Gnar. And I think that's true considering the Black Cleaver uh, if he wants to start the split push. The larger question though is can WE play around a very strong split pushing 957 with the Gnar? As we say, one pick on it this year. And when this team has struggled, it feels like they need to play around Mystic. Yet it is Gnar who has a large percentage of the gold rank. A lot of the play pattern this game has been, can Impact get enough to justify Gnar auto attacking down turret after turret? And that will still be true, but with all this disengage, it's so hard to be reliable as Cloud9 to make that big Shen play under the nose of the Gnar, and of course Gnar situationally can be a teamfight beast on his own. So one of them goes wrong in kind of the way the first one was a bit of a misfire. I mean, you're going to lose basically every inner turret, every outer turret, and the side lanes especially, very early in this game. Well, still be a big change here despite the gold evening back up. Mystic has finished his Rage Blade, so Sneaky, looking for a bit more farm, has the Static Shift now to join that BF Sword, but he got a lot of gold, he did not get enough for two items, so even keel for the ADs, could be bad times. 957 getting full, man. They're trying to full collapse on the Gnar. He is very slippery, though. Great. Nice interrupt. Still has flash and Mega. Yep. Nearly range now. Shockwave misses. 957 flushes out of the way, but the damage might still be too much. Galio, though, get a damage reduction in. Does get the knock up onto Jensen. And 957 skirts away. Shie also trying to leave, but Galio is so tanky. And impact is left all by him. Lonesome trying to defend that bottom lane turret. The minion wave's not even in, in position for them to push. Team WE crushing the pressure game. It's single target build right now. The Hurricanes, they're happy to take down turrets. The crowd explodes. They know that WE have traded up in this scenario, and they're not stopping anytime soon. They don't have to stop. Impact cannot hold against that push right there, but Shie has the Galio wave clear. C9 cannot make ground. Certainly cannot. C9 have to force Jensen down there as well. He'll clear the wave. That's what they need to move things out of the way, but trading up seems to be the biggest thing that WE have gotten in all of these exchanges. Yes, C9 is hitting with four kills, but they don't have the gold lead, and certainly not the lead in general. And Vision 
is where they are lacking as well. 957 sees them on the Rift Herald, pushes him immediately off of it. Because WE has vision control in C9's blue buff of the jungle, they can just rotate all the way across mid lane and take this Rift Herald. And Rift Herald over. Easy take there in the crowd. Starting to get a little more excited with each and every objective. Reminding me a little bit of SKT versus C9 game two, where we saw uh, impact in the late game, try to make a big proactive play, and Huni end the game. Obviously not as comical as that particular game, but with 957 on unfamiliar ground, they're playing around top lane pressure. No, top lane pressure without a jungler needed. Just the innate nature of the Shen versus Nar matchup, where Shen is being proactive around the map. They're playing around that pressure well. They're getting a lot more map control than W has had in a lot of these games so far, barring game four. And the items keep rolling in, and C9, they're still in that awkward position where from behind, in terms of gold, even with the four kill lead, they need to be setting the tempo of this game, unless we're going late, late. Yeah, helping out as well, of course, no jungler, but Galio being there does give 957 a lot of extra insurance. He's basically a jungler, Galio, yep. let's be real. <laughs> Might as well be. Yeah. Contracts all deep, also the flash by Mystic Summon a spell. Yeah, but they still have a lot of protection left for him with the Janna ultimate and shield and heal. Contracts ultimate. Wave in the choke point. Jensen has a lot of damage. Condi actually going to be found. Flashes out of the way. Stands Trying to go all in. They're committing. They get the permafrost and she is ulti. Will deliver him in, but now he's jungle is not there, 957 needs some rage, but Mystic, he's just going forward, they need to kill this damage dealer and cannot do it, Impact, he'll die to see as wins of war, and 957 looking for more, plus Kun is good from Smoothie, but C9 make a trade. And you saw, Galio doesn't take damage at this stage in the game, C9 was actually waiting around thinking that the Galio was going to be in and they're going to be able to force a summer spell out or something, but they just stood there and had to eat damage from Mystic, these extended fights against a late game Kog'Maw, he gets max stacks on that Ginsu's Rage, and absolutely shreds percent health with his bio arcane barrage. And even though Gia's ult was late and he flashed as he was stunned and got no value out of the flash taunt, it was still a one for one. That's what happens with this champ profile and where the gold is, the fact that Mystic is still healthy. Connie just dies straight up. He's ulted by the Galio so late. They get no value out of it at all. And then watch also as he tries to come in with the taunt, he's actually stunned up doesn't get any value from it at all. It's a better fight than you would expect for C9 with where the game is at, and yet it's even. And you see how fast Impact died there. The shred they get from the Black Cleaver on Nar, from the Kog'Maw Q, gets rid of any resistances he may have had, and Sneaky's gonna have a hard time getting away from this one. On the verge of getting 2v1, good flush out of the barrel. Lulu's here, Sneaky just has to dodge everything. The Pokemon is good, sorry, the Whimsy actually for a bit of extra speed, and he gets out. He shouldn't have been there in the first place, nope. but that was a great escape sidestepping pretty much everything to allow Smoothie the time to catch up. Even able to trade flashes with Janna, so if you find a way to pop her with the Orianna ult, that would be big for the side of C9. They push out minion waves well. Better, better than expected is kind of the story for the last two engagements we've seen. And again, the tagline for the series, don't forget, as the man you just saw in mid lane, Jensen, is responsible for punishing Mystic and Ben for not having flashes. He's had a good landing phase, now finished two items. So is she, though, so don't worry about yeah. the Galio. He's not dying anytime soon. And also the locket means he will be able to shield reactively on the Shockwave animation if he is on his game which prevents the one-shot coming into Mystic. It was a build we saw from Caps actually yesterday. They ended up with three lockets on the day, Fnatic. That part I don't agree with. We did it this early. It's basically saying, I'm going to absorb Shockwave, and I can still position for the taunt. But of course, Galio is most known for. Interesting Rift Herald summon right there. You would have expected them to go straight for the Infernal Drake with that Rift Herald mid, but they're a little bit slow. It does give them position in that zone, though. C9 having to burn a few cooldowns. They're going for mid-priority instead of second Infernal Drake. Looking for the play, no flash though, and takes a little bit of damage. Mystic though, just barreling into impact. Oh, the stun lands on the Mystic. Tia there for the ultimate. Almost a move completely. Full health cog after all that. Jensen getting chased down by 957. He's about to go mega. Flush it, but then our contract tries to defend, but he cannot get it as Mystic will find the kill. And our contract's on the wrong side. Blast cones out, but I don't think he's safe. Lock it. They are already out bursting with heals the damage that is coming from Jensen. They weren't able to take him down. Contracts on the great escape, but a very worrying omen for C9 that when everything hits, they still can't pick up a kill. Yeah, and they don't get that much more damage. By the way,
Baron is up. You expect the Infernal Drake to be a thing, but now Ben keeping contracts away, and Team WE trying to do Baron. It is on award. What a great play by Ben to just force this kill Mystic, most likely, or they're trying to burn it all the way down. Impact's trying something. They're just going to try and finish it off here. They can get it. They don't have a smart. Remember, Condi is here. A miracle steal could keep C9 in the game. Condi, though, waiting very patiently, and now Sneaky caught out by Mystic. He's going to go down to the Living Artillery. This is the point in the game that Team WE wanted to hit, where they have the super strong Kog'Maw and Ben still keeping contracts at Ben. Ben is the superstar here. This entire time, the Yakety Sax music has been playing as Janna just stops contracts from being able to recall, to get to Baron, to do anything. He had already done his job. He did not need to be involved in the fight and denying the smite, man, it was a freebie for Team WE. Also means they can now move straight down for their second Infernal Drake of the game. Mystic also bought a QSS, which hurts the super late game damage, but the power spike right now makes it even harder for C9 to try and catch him. Well, easy Infernal over to WE. Condi again. Simple smite to take that objective. And again, the crowd is only getting louder as WE get further and further ahead. And I think they're choosing the right time to roar, not just because they're ahead, not just because they feel good about the Baron, because when you go lock it this early on Galio, QSS this early, I think they just want to get all the advantages now. I could see WE barreling into C9, using the locket to try to disregard the damage from Jensen and basically break the base in this Baron buff duration. And we've seen this a lot about teams who are good with Galio. Galio just walks up to the turret, sometimes tanks it even, and that gives you the eight seconds or so that it takes to kill a turret. Double Infernal just makes it even easier. And the fact that they have a frozen mountain in the side lane, the impact also can't match. Yep, first order of business though for WE is to take down that mid out, and they do so simply. And now again, gonna move back in onto this tier two. 957 already forced someone out, so he's gonna also take a bonus turret here in the bot side very soon. You're just stacking bad decisions for WE. Who do you send to answer? The Shen under turret, but no more than that. If Galio's top lane, it doesn't matter. Cogmo can push in with the ult. She walks up, presses W, and half the turret, in fact, all of it is gone. Nothing C9 can do. Sneaky was clearing away from the top lane. They're also losing the bot lane turret. This gold lead is absolutely ballooning. This is one of the strongest points in the game for this composition. The two major items are Cogma and Galio is at his most unkillable since no one has armor or magic pen yet. No need to move away either. Good stuff all around there as Cena trying to force them away, but 957 finishes his business here in the bot lane. And it's six turrets to one now. C9 running out of room. I don't know what a one fight for team, it's one team fight for C9 looks like. I don't think they have the damage to penetrate. No. Their turrets are dying. C9 are in full base defense mode, but they're gonna try something. Ulti finds only Ben looking to try and impact it in. Shockwave is enough to get the kill as she has ultimate. Does move in, but Impact able to get the kill. Shea again, just tanking it all, and the turret goes down. Cena falls back once more. Shea dives in, trying to find something. Permafrost is not bad, but Mystic just unabashedly hitting this inhibitor, and it falls down. That was probably the best case for C9, killing the support before Ben can use Monsoon, and they still lose the inhibitor. No threat on Mystic, not the slightest threat on Mystic at all means they can just keep moving forward, taking down objectives every time the Bio Arcane Barrage comes off cooldown. Rinse and repeat, it's a third Infernal for WE. Everything lining up for the Chinese home crowd team and C9. They continue the base defense. They need two more items on their carries, and WE, they want the game to end before. Yeah, and we're gonna watch this one more time. Contracts threads the needle, needle, they chain everything, even through the Galio ultimate, but by going in, Impact cannot actually live through the Kog'Maw at this stage in the game. He went Titanic Hydra to try and match some of the push from the NAR, not even close. And it may only be six and a half thousand gold ahead for WE, but the effective gold lead is much larger than that, and if Things could not get any better as W are trying to close the series if they do not win off this. Of all things, the third Infernal in a row has spawned for WE. And numbers are sometimes important when we're talking about scalings, but really it's about two and a half items on the Cogmaw. The fact that right now you can't get tanky against the Cogmaw, even on two members, only one adaptive helm completed on the side of impact, nothing for contracts. With where the total gold is at, 92,000 between two teams, it's so hard for C9. And even without Baron, they can just walk up to the turret because of the power spikes they're on right now. Mystic sidestep the shockwave is a nice salt threads through for contracts, but it just doesn't matter. 
Jensen saved his ultimate, but your down, sorry, Impact saved his ultimate, but Jensen and Contracts are without theirs, which means if Team W do want to keep up this push, they can. But now they'll just cut down to the mid lane, keep pushing. They don't need to have the Galio there. His ultimate will be available, I believe, in a second. Small monitor here, but I believe it will be available just now. Mystic walks up. He is already basically a fountain laser in terms of damage. And he's tanking turret hits. Jensen's threatening him, but Ben walks up, shields him, and Mystic just slowly but surely throws Goo into the turret. So important for C9 that they don't lose their second inhibitor because that makes it all too easy for Team WE to cycle it down. They had rotated mid to defend, but now they have to make it all the way up towards topside. Is he in base? He wants to teleport on a minion. He's got the Elixir of Iron as well. To help with that turret dive. Over seven, caught out of position, almost goes mega. At and the C9 turret. don't overcommit with the turret. TP in instantly, and now that inhibitor is exposed. C9, you must go now. They're trying to hold off as long as they can. If they can keep the Shen ultimate, it gives them more flexibility down the road. But Team W does not want to leave before killing this inhibitor. Oh, Drunk Wave actually on the Mystic, Doesn't but matter. again, might not matter. Jensen, he's going to get CC. Clan splashes out of the way. But WE moving forward. Gia is impenetrable as Sneaky is just try as he might to get him down. But the turret goes down. C9 found the jump, and it wasn't enough. Team WE playing so well around this power spike. You can see the unkillable Gal. You can see the absolutely shredding Mystic. And these fans have waited so long to see Team WE in the semifinals. The last time they were at Worlds was 2012. WE spent five games of the series trying to assemble their LPL faithful comp, and they got about as close as can be in this game. The locket has trivialized damage. They're able to walk up. Doesn't matter if Mystic eats a shockwave. They will be able to persevere through that. And I love that stat, Jack, because Cloud9 have been to every Worlds they could qualify for. The first one they could even qualify for was the next year in 2013. It has been so long since Team WE, who started rebuilding around that famous IEM run two and a half years ago, have finally made to this stage. And that's why the roar from this crowd, if WE can maintain what right now seems like an unassailable lead, will be insane. And C9 also want to try and hold on as long as possible. This is the most games they have won in a quarterfinal in their history. They're up, they were up 2-1 in this series, one win away from the finals. But as you mentioned, Team WE, Double Infernal, Triple Infernal all the way, even if they don't have much attack damage and ability power to multiply with this buff, still substantial. And another Baron on the board. Just continue to ignore the gold lead. WE are a finite amount ahead as the gold shows, but it just does not matter. Three Infernals, a dream roll of the dice for WE for what looks to be their final game in this quarterfinal. And C9 can't get control of the minion waves. That has kind of been the story of the game. Every wave has been pushing well. Even the Caitlyn that C9 prioritized, instead of picking the Galio for themselves, hasn't been able to find that edge. And yeah, Sneaky just finished his last Whisper. It's going to help a bit, but he's so far away from relevant damage. You get the C9 draft, though. Rolling on Jana Kate to WE yep. would also be a full zone. We'll be sitting here. The game might be ended by 30 minutes. Say, of course. But unfortunately, it's been best case scenario with the Jana Cog, which is the more quintessential WE choice. As Baron started, the Nara is pushing, and everything's happening for WE. And that's just been the thing. Everything is working right now for WE. Feels like they cannot put a foot wrong as Jensen ganks 957, delivering Baron basically to WE. But I don't think they can fight for it anyway. WE only getting closer to the semifinal. And they played these last two games so clean. The first game. Uh, rather, game four, after they were one game from elimination, they jumped out ahead in kills. C9 probably had the better scaling in that game four, but Team WE did all the rotations with Talia properly. This game as well, even when they were down four kills to zero, they never relented their map play, always keeping the right waves in the right places. Now they're trying to catch out Impact. Just everything, even going to check to see what Impact was doing as he just runs away, flashless, has his ultimate, but he's not going to make it out alive. Impact! He will fall. Mystic, of course, will get it. And this means no Shen for 50 seconds as Team WE look to assault the final inhibitor turret in the mid lane. Feel the crowd only getting louder. Shie displays his flair proudly. WE rebuilt so long ago to finally make it back to this point. Five years since their first world's appearance. 
And they're just going straight for it. Shea flies over the Caitlyn Traps. They are ignoring C9. Yep, 957 again, just pushing the tank away. Sneaky is doing what he can. But there is little that C9 can hold on to. That third inhib is down. Baron still up for two more minutes. Team WWE looking to become the second Chinese team in the semifinals, probably on this push. It's the, it's the cleanse is out of the way. 957 pushes them all the way. The shockwave is good, but it will not be enough impact. It's trying to make it happen, but Mystic, the champion, the hero of WWE, will hold on. They weather a brutal storm, and Waterley will push themselves to a historic semifinal. Listen to that crowd. That is what they came here to see. A victorious Team WE playing around their style. There will be tons of questions about this series when you rewatch and analyze it. Mystic consistently controlling Kog'Maw, orchestrating the draft in that last game to get Galio for themselves as well. Team WE looked best when it mattered most and wins game five. And it's easiest to talk about the long time between Worlds events. It's 2012, 2017. But they also had more immediate history to answer. Their struggles in best of five on the year. They got to MSI, could not progress as expected in MSI, fell in the semifinals there. Their ability to get back to the semifinals here, to actually get over the hurdle of what was an indomitable performance from Cloud9, a very impressive performance compared to last year where they fell at the first chance to Samsung Galaxy. WE will continue to try to answer, but now we get the hometown team versus the Korean team, two China versus Korea semifinals. We're still with Korea largely underperforming with SKT smarting after a five game series against Misfits. I think Chinese fans will realistically believe that maybe this is their year. Listen, both of these teams won their groups. RNG won their group over Samsung, who then took down Longju. So there are ways you can believe they can win these games. They've already taken down Korea at Rift Rivals. That was a very meaningful moment for the LPL. And then also getting the number one seed in both of those group stages and then qualifying both teams to the semifinals. A single bow is more than enough to earn the adoration of this gymnasium. WE have.